Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Judy and I'm a very grateful alcoholic. Hi, everybody. Very grateful to be here tonight uh, with you and, and to be in Tampa and, and grateful for the weekend. Uh, I do want to thank the committee. Uh, God has a way of, of doing things for me that I can't do for myself. And I've had uh, a couple of weeks that have been uh, real rough. I'm not complaining. They've just been rough. They've been long weeks. And, uh, and I haven't been able to get much rest and uh, flew in here yesterday and was able to to rest a little bit and then to enjoy today and enjoy the fellowship and being with people that I love to be with. Um, I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a believer in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm a believer in the traditions, and I'm a believer in the steps. And uh, when I came to you, I was hopeless. Uh, The big book tells me, the instructions tell me that our stories disclose in a general way what I used to be like, what happened, and what I'm like today. And I try and hold to that format, and if I get off on a tangent somewhere, I find out that I don't get the feeling um, that I've done what God wanted me to do up here. So I try and stick to the instructions. I do feel, though, that um, uh, perhaps I'm maybe the only uh, really low-bottom drunk that's here. You know, I'm amazed at the amount of attorneys I run into now when I don't need them. And, you know, all of them seem so loving now. I I don't know about you, but the ones I met when I was drinking weren't loving. (laughs) They were a lot like cops as far as I was concerned. (laughs) I have some very strong opinions about Alcoholics Anonymous, and sometimes that might step on some people's toes, and I wish I could tell you that I'm sorry, Uh, but I'm not because the, the program has saved my life, and I believe very strongly in what this program stands for and what we are to do here and what I've learned here. And uh, I'm not going to go a whole lot into my childhood. Uh, there's some things that I bring up, and perhaps some of you may find them uncomfortable, and perhaps some of you may find them even uh, distasteful. Uh, I've done as best as, as I could um, uh, to make it uh, uh, tasteful. Uh, but I grew up in an alcoholic home, and there isn't much that's tasteful about an alcoholic home. Uh, I try to use discretion. Uh, as best as I can, but I don't clean it up to the point that I don't recognize my own story anymore, you see. Um, I am not one of those women who came into Alcoholics Anonymous and decided after two years sobriety I was a virgin again. I, um, my mother was divorced when I was about five years old from my dad, and there was an Al-Anon who spoke yesterday, Billy, and she was talking about her dad, and her dad was very much like my dad. My dad came back from World War II, and my dad never recovered from World War II, and uh, after being home about six or seven years, uh, he finally had a complete and total nervous breakdown and was made a ward uh, of the state of Michigan, and they, too, tried the same thing with my dad that they did with Billy's and uh, with a lot of shock treatments. And uh, after about 12 years of shock treatments, you know, you just don't function well anymore. And uh, I don't have any resentment. The state did the best for him they could at the time. They didn't know any better. You know, but he uh, remained a, a ward of the state of Michigan until the day he died. Um, because of this program and because of this fellowship, the last time I had seen my father prior to the divorce, I was five years old. When I was in this program a few years uh, I got the opportunity to go back and see my dad. And, uh, and, and he knew because we had started, I had started writing letters to him shortly after I got sober. You know, and although he was not able to function, he could carry on a conversation and, and he could write letters. And, and because of the things I learned here, I was able to see my dad after 20 years. And that was wonderful. Um, speaking of which, my home group is the Carrollton Group in Carrollton, Ohio. And uh, my sobriety date is December the 18th, 1972. And I was 23 years old, so don't calculate, I'm 44. <laughs> when, I got to, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was 23 years old, and I'm grateful for that. And I've stayed in Alcoholics Anonymous since the very first meeting, and I'm grateful for that as well. My mother remarried oh, about a year after this divorce, and she was to bring into our lives 
a very lovely, lovely man uh, who had a great sense of humor and a great deal of compassion, and he was extremely sensitive uh, towards other people and his feelings and his own feelings. And I loved him. I just adored him. I just adored him. And, uh, and he was a very successful man and a brilliant man. And uh, he was also an alcoholic in the early stages of alcoholism. And my home was like some alcoholic home, certainly not like all. But as his disease progressed, our home became a home of violence. Our home became one of those homes where you didn't know what to say, when to say it. And if you ever did say anything, you said it at the wrong time or you said the wrong thing and you just never knew what to do. Uh, I was the oldest of three girls and uh, I was defiant all my life, even as a very, very small child, I was defiant. It just seemed to me like if somebody told you not to do something, there had to be some fun buried in there somewhere, you know. So you just had to do it just to find out why you weren't supposed to do it. And I, I developed that pattern early and carried it for many years. But uh, it, there was my defiance and, and my personality and then his, and there was a tr tremendous clash there. And uh end result of that was I got knocked around a lot when I was a kid. It was nothing uncommon for me to be slammed up against the wall. Uh, I had my nose broken. I had a couple of rib ribs cracked and uh, and more black eyes and cut lips than I care to remember. Uh, and I was also one of those kids, uh, one of the uh, young women who was sexually abused. And uh, I uh, bring that up because in working with women in Alcoholics Anonymous, I very often hear this, well, you don't understand. You don't understand why I can't stay sober. You don't know what happened to me as a, as a child. You don't know what he did to me. And you see, I don't buy that. I don't buy that at all because Alcoholics Anonymous and working the steps and working with sponsors in this program fix that too. You know. And I am one of those women who believe that as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous, I am a normal functioning human being today. Okay, I don't have to walk around feeling sorry for myself and consider myself a victim the rest of my life. All right, my childhood was taken from me. I'll be damned if you'll have my adulthood, too. Okay? And those are the kind of things I get opinionated about, and I don't usually say damn from the podium, but it just slipped. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was about 14, I think, when I finally decided I could start throwing punches back. Now, many of you may not be able to relate to this, but I know a lot of you can. Because I threw that first punch and it hit my stepfather right on the jaw, and my God, I loved it. I loved everything about fighting. You know, I took my first drink at the age of 10. I never had any problem with learning to like alcohol. There wasn't a thing about the drug alcohol I didn't love from the very first drink on. It never, ever changed. From that very first drink, I wanted a second. And if I was in a situation where I know, knew there was only going to be one drink, I didn't touch it because I knew it would start. And I knew, I, I, I knew I'd get that craving going, and I knew that I'd tighten up on the inside if I couldn't get more. But it was that way from the very first drink. And by the time I was 14, I was an alcoholic as I know an alcoholic to be today. I was drinking as much as I could steal, as often as I could steal it. And I, I was going to school with a hangover. And, I, and, he, and at that early age, I was sick. I was physically sick. With my stepfather drinking alcoholically, my mother was drinking heavily at the time. She was quit years later and never touched another drop. You know, and I understand a lot why she drank the way that she did. That's the only way my mother had to cope. But when her reason for drinking was gone, she quit drinking and there was no more reason for her to drink. You know, and for many years I couldn't understand that. But you see, it was different for me. It was different for me because I never really had to have a reason to drink. I just drank. I was one of those kids everything hurt. I was a child of the 60s. You know, and there was so much going on in our country in the 60s. And everything was painful to me. Everything was painful. I'd turn on the TV and I'd see the race riots in the streets of our cities and I'd see fellow Americans getting beat up and chewed up with dogs and I'd go to bed and I'd cry because I could not stand to think that was going on. You know, guys that I went to high school with were going over and fighting a war that they didn't believe in. You know, and then they were coming back and being treated so poorly and I couldn't stand it. And the only way I could deal with it is drink. You know, I didn't drink to get high. I didn't drink to get happy. I didn't drink for any of those things. I drank to check out, just to check out. I didn't want to feel any particular way at all. I just didn't want to feel. I didn't want to feel anything because everything to me on the outside was so painful. And I just didn't want to feel. And I drank. 
I got out of high school and I went and did the things. And you have to, I was raised in Atlanta, the bulk of my life in Atlanta, uh, Georgia. And, uh, and I was raised on the north side of Atlanta and we were raised in a community that was, uh, somewhat affluent and, and, um, and money was very, very important, and I never could understand that either. You know, outside appearances were very, very important, and I couldn't understand that either. Because we always had to project the right outside appearance, you see. Always had to look good on the outside. And then we'd come home and beat each other up, and it never made any sense to me. Nothing made any sense to me. And so I was a confused and sick kid, you know. And I just had no sense of direction. Resentment and anger were a problem for me way before the first drink. You know, I always had a problem with my temper. Even when I, when I was eight years old, I got in trouble in school for hitting a girl. And, uh, and, uh, she had said something against one of my friends, uh, uh, and it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a racial slur, and I hit her. And, uh, and I hit her hard, and she was bleeding, and, um, and the teacher got all kinds of upset, and they called my parents in and everything else, and of course I lied and said she started it. And, uh, and nobody believed it because everybody in school saw it, you know. But there was a problem there on the inside long before the first drink. That something wasn't right. And and that's kind of what I brought here, you know. As time went on, and as I said, I got out of high school and I got a job. And I got a job that was respectable because I had to keep up that respectable image. I had to do those things that were considered right and okay. And I got a job in a very large department store in Atlanta, uh, Riches, and, and I did very well there. And we alcoholics can do very well. You know, uh, we alcoholics fall upstairs. We're the only people I know of that can fall upstairs. <laughs> You know, and, 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 and I did, I did, and because I worked hard and because, and you see, I did work hard and I did do a good job, but the motive was wrong. My motive was I had to prove to myself I was okay. I had to prove to myself I was okay. It was not because I necessarily wanted to be successful, but I had to have some kind of concrete proof that I was okay. And so when I was promoted on that job, I was the youngest head of sales that Riches had ever had. And I had 40 women working for me during the Christmas season, and most of them were two and three times my age, you know. And during regular season, I had 20 women working for me, and I was doing fine. I was doing fine by all, all outside appearances, but inside I was dying, and you know that. Because inside what was happening, after I got off of that nice job and I went home, back then retail closed at 6.30, and I went home and I stopped at my favorite liquor store. And my favorite, I never moved anywhere where there wasn't a liquor store within walking distance. I know. And there was a liquor store and there was a bar that was right next to that liquor store. It was a wonderful neighborhood, the favorite, my favorite out of all of them I lived in. And the bar was called, honest to God, it was called The Hole in the Wall. That was the name of the bar. Real top-notch place. And... um <laughs> I'd get off of that bus and I'd go into my liquor store and I'd buy my quart and my six pack for the evening and I'd go home uh, and I'd start drinking. I'd start drinking before the only thing that came off before the cork was my shoes and uh, and I'd pour that drink and I'd get started. You know, and I'd finish that quart off and I'd finish that six pack off and then I'd go up to the hole in the wall uh, and I'd see which one I was going to fall in love with that night. Um, and I'd walk into that bar and I'd look up and down that bar stool and I'd see those same guys there. I don't know how many times. Every once in a while, we'd get a newcomer. And um, <laughs> and that would be my my love of the evening. Uh, and I wish I could tell you that this just happened every now and then, <clears throat> that it was just once in a while, but it wasn't. It was a routine. It was a nightly thing for me. I never gave a thought to what kind of chance I was taking. I never gave any thought to anything like that. It just didn't matter. You see, because by now in my disease, I had reached those times where those nights are so, so lonely. You know, I never really wanted any mar- I didn't want to get married. I, the thought of, of marriage just bored me. But it, it, there was just no variety, and it just didn't appeal to me at all. I just didn't want to get married. And uh, so I ended up bringing these guys home. And uh, a lot of them would leave, and of course I never knew their name. And I know a lot of them would uh, be there a couple hours, and sometimes they'd stay overnight, and sometimes a couple of minutes. You know how that goes. And uh, <laughs> I always like to look over the audience when I say that and see which one of you guys are blushing. <laughs> And that's okay. If you're blushing, you keep coming back. That gets better, too. So, yeah. (laughs) Oh, isn't that tacky? Um, (laughs) 
Uh, and you know, I knew too within myself that the way I was living wasn't right. And I think what's paramount for me when I look at myself in these years is that I didn't care. Somewhere along the line, I had just adopted the attitude of I don't care. It doesn't matter. And throughout my sobriety, that has been a danger sign for me. When I get to the point where I think it doesn't matter anymore. It's not worth it anymore. You know, because that's the attitude I lived in for so many years. It just doesn't matter. You know, I hear a lot of people say that they fought being an alcoholic and and I can understand that. But for me, I knew I was alcoholic. Somehow I knew I was an alcoholic. I knew when, when I went out with my high school friends, I didn't drink like they did. Things happened to me and I behaved differently than what they did. You know, they just they would go out and they'd get drunk and they'd all laugh and the next day everything was fine. And I never felt that way. You know, somehow I always felt guilty. I always felt remorseful. I always felt bad. My drinking was different. You know, my temper at this stage, right out of high school and up until the time I came into the program, was volatile and I was dangerous. And there was no doubt that I was dangerous because I didn't care. I didn't fight for the sake of fighting. I fought to kill you. You know, I was an animal. I was an animal. And this is the way that I lived. And I can remember I went home one weekend to visit my mom. And my stepfather was there, of course, and, and he said something, and I was drunk, and I remember hitting him, and I remember the fight starting. And all I can remember is my two sisters and my mother pulling me off of him, and my mama screaming, my God, Judy, you're killing him. My God, Judy, you've got to stop. You're killing him. You know, and that's all I remember. And I remember just sitting on top of that man with my hands around his throat and watching him turn blue and thinking to myself, die, damn you, die. And I got up and walked away. No. And I can't, I I cannot fathom being that sick. I can't fathom it. And I went and got drunk. Of course, what else would I do? What else do we do in those mornings when we get up and we look in the mirror and we know the way that we're treating the people we love and our friends and the people that we care about? What else do you do? You see, you can't live with the pain. You can't live with it, so you got to start the whole circus all over again. It's got to start all over again. You know, and so it was with me. And it did, I don't need to tell you that the job didn't last long. And I made a brilliant decision based on clear alcoholic thinking that I needed to go into the bar and restaurant business. <laughs> and that business is what got me to this program at 23. I swear to you, that was a crazy, crazy business. In the city the size of Atlanta, what would happen is a new place would open up and everybody just kind of moved to the new place or the new area. There'd be a new section of town that would open up and it was, my God, Bill, how in the world are you, honey? I, lo- I haven't seen this man down here for how many years? Seven? Yes. And he's from Atlanta. It's good to see you. Um, where was I? Were you listening? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but anyhow... Um, Thank you. And so we'd go on. See, I used to sponsor her, so I know she's listening. <laughs> Sweetie. Uh, we would we'd just pick up and, and go, you know, and the money was over in Marietta, so that's where you went to work. And uh, there was never any loyalty. It's where the money was. And we took off. You know? And that's just kind of just like a bunch of nomads just kind of working around the city of Atlanta. And and I was working in some good places at the time, and as the drinking got worse, the places got worse. You know, and I started having to take jobs where you worked for tips only. And I started having to take jobs in places like the Blue Cockatoo. You know, and the Blue Cockatoo, if there wasn't at least three fights every night, something was wrong. You know, there was something wrong with the place. It was a rough place. And it was nothing to be in there on, on, a, on a weekend night in particular and somebody break a beer bottle and come after somebody else and you're carrying a tray of drinks and you just learn to duck and keep right on working. You know, and the fight's going on around you because that's the way it happens. And the gal that owned the place was a big gal and she could pretty well break up any fight that started anyhow. So none of us ever worried about it because we knew Lou would take care of it. You know, and we just kept right on working. And I was drunk all the time. Just all the time. Things got so bad for me physically, I couldn't show up for a job even like that anymore. Even in a place like that, I just couldn't do it. And by now, you see, I had just turned legal age to drink, you know, in the state of Georgia. And I was a wreck. The shakes had been a problem for me since I was about 17 years old. It was just no big deal for me. It was part of it. All of it was part of it. 
I know. And I'm, I can promise you right now that today, if the only thing that ever got me here was physical, I wouldn't have stayed. No. I wouldn't have stayed because the physical was just routine for me to getting up, being sick. That was just routine. That was nothing. I mean, if you drank the way I wanted to drink, that's the price you had to pay, and I was willing to pay that price. It just wasn't that big a deal to me, you know. But it was uh, what kept me here on the onset was the fact that I may have to go back out there and live and live through all that garbage again and again and again. That's what kept me here. You know, and things got worse, and they got worse, and the fights got worse, and they got more frequent, and I got more like an animal. You know, and as much as I'd want to get up and I'd want to bathe and I'd want to clean myself up, I just didn't have the energy. And as much as I wanted to get up and I wanted to clean up the apartment and change the sheets and empty the ashtrays and have the place looking like a human being living there, I just didn't have the energy. I'd get up and I'd strip those sheets that had been on there God knows how long, and, and I just didn't have the energy to put new ones on, you know, so I just slept on the mattress. Because it just wasn't there. I wanted, I wanted to be different, but I didn't know what else to do. And I just kept drinking. And then it, as I said, it got to the point where I couldn't tend bar anymore. And then couldn't work as a cocktail waitress anymore. Because I, I just didn't have the strength to go into work. And no matter how hard I tried, it just wasn't there. And I called a guy I had known in the bar and restaurant business. And I went to work as a prostitute, as a hooker on the streets of Atlanta. Because that's all I could do. I didn't have any choice. And a lot of times when I share that at a meeting, you'll see mixed expressions because some people feel very uncomfortable about that. I can promise each and every one of you in here that if you were not at your alcoholism where I was at mine and you decide for some reason you want to go back, you will end up out there. Don't think it won't happen to you. There will come a time in your drinking you will sell your soul to Satan face to face, baby, to get that next drink. Don't ever think it won't happen. That is not what I started out to do in life. You know, we didn't sit around in our little country club set and say, you know, I think I want to work peach tree and tent. I think that'll be my corner. <laughs> that's not what we did. You know, and that's not where I was headed. And that's not what we, that's not the way it was supposed to be. But again, you see, by the time I got there, it didn't matter. It just didn't matter. No. Recently, I went to a meeting, and this troubles me, and this is why I'm going to share it. Recently, I went to a meeting, and unbeknownst, I am relatively new to Ohio. I've only been there like, well, it'll be a year. But uh, the groups there, it's all uh, speakers meetings. And uh, there was a young lady sitting there at an anniversary. And uh, I didn't know her. She didn't know me. And she's sitting talking with another young woman. And she said, you know, I've heard an awful lot about women in Alcoholics Anonymous standing behind the podium and saying that they were whores. And she said, I really don't think that should be mentioned here. And you all would have been proud. Because I didn't reach across the table and slap her. I just... <laughs> and what my true feeling is, and see, I had to wait six and a half years to hear my story. Okay? Now, I don't know how you feel, but to me, that's a crying shame. Nobody should have to sit out there and wait six and a half years to hear their story. And the reason I had to wait is because so many women came in here and cleaned it up that I thought I was the only one. And that, see, do something, please, for, for yourself and for Alcoholics Anonymous. Don't you ever clean up so well you forget where you come from. Don't ever do it. Okay. I sat out there thinking, you know, you won't accept me if you know what I did. You won't accept me uh, if you knew what I did. And I kept waiting, and I kept waiting. And only because of the love of a lot of men in this program, okay, they kept telling me, Judy, come back. There were two guys that were my sponsors. You're going to hear your story someday. And I believed him. And I believed them. And like the other things, they didn't lie. It took six and a half years, but by God, I finally heard it. You know? And I happen to know there's more than two of us in this program. <laughs> okay. And there will still be those that will walk out a bit sanctimoniously and say, well, I didn't sink to that level. 
no, honey, you got it confused. You just didn't get paid for it. I did. <laughs> That's one of those things I'm a little opinionated about, in case you didn't pick up on it. <laughs> I got to I got to tell you that the the months that followed thereafter and I and, and thank God thank God my dear God that I didn't have to stay out there for years like I've seen some women have to do I don't know how they do it I just honest to God don't know and my heart breaks every time I see one of them it, it just breaks uh, but I got real sick and my mom uh, finally, she and I got together via telephone conversation. Long and short of that is, I signed into a state hospital, and because uh, I, I was a mess, and I knew I was a mess, and I didn't, I didn't know, you know, I knew that the drinking was a big problem, but there has to be something else here because alcoholics just don't get this screwed up, you know. So I got, so I got something else wrong here, and I go in and I check into that hospital, and I stayed there six months, and uh, I thought I was going to check in and do one of those, you know inpatient deals and they'd let me go out at night and I could go on about my business and uh, that's not quite what they decided to do they put my fanny out locked ward and uh, they kept me there for six months and they watched me it was one of those places that that uh, Ray was talking about they wouldn't let you have matches and uh and I always thought it a bit odd, you know, when when you go to when you go into the nurse's station and you tell them that you're taking a bath and you want your razor and they give it to you <laughs> you know now, you could be in that bathroom for 45 minutes bleeding to death, and they never come check on you, but you got to go get it from them for safety purposes. I haven't been able to figure that out yet. <laughs> but I lived there, and uh, one of the things that came to me, and I was five years sober when it came to me, was what my shrink had told me when I wanted a, a weekend pass, and they wouldn't give me one because my behavior was a bit bizarre. Um, I had threatened another one of the patients there. I don't remember what she did, but I remember it, it was reason enough for me to want to kill her. And um, he told me that, uh, he said, Judy, I can't let you out this weekend. And he said, I don't know how long it's going to be before I can let you out because you are, you're dangerous, Judy. You're a danger to yourself and you're a danger to society. And later on, through some talking and Listen, and I was to find out that when I was locked up in there, they didn't put me in there for alcoholism. They put me in for being suicidal, homicidal. And those kind of people are the kind of people that will walk up to you and shoot you and turn around and walk away. And that's how sick I was. I had no respect for human life of any kind, for nobody. Because so many years I had cut off so many nerves so that I wouldn't feel anymore that I had gotten to the point where I was totally and completely unfeeling. I conditioned myself to do that. Some of it, yes, was out of survival for me. Okay. I could not feel. It would be dangerous for me to feel. Some of it was out of just I had to in order to just keep enough going to function. You know? And that's hard for me to believe. That's so hard for me to believe. Through a series of con jobs that I ran very well, I got a three-hour pass from that shrink about a month later to go get my winter clothes from my mother's home. I'm still out on that three-hour pass. <laughs> and I had, uh, I had a man waiting for me at the gate, and, and he had, uh, I believe it was three quarts of black velvet Canadian blend and two cases of Miller High Life. And I don't need to tell you what happened. But it was some time later. My mother and I have tried to put this together, and as best as we can tell, it was 10 to 14 days later after I was reported as missing uh, that uh, somebody brought me over to her house and poured me off in her den. And she was to come home from work that day to tw find her 23-year-old daughter 10 to 14 days without a bath or a change of clothes, stinking from booze and sleeping with men. And that's what she found. We have a, a step that deals with the men's in this fellowship. And for what I put my mother through, saying I'm sorry is not enough. It is simply not enough. Now, it may be enough as the book reads, but for me it was not enough. 
and I had to find a way somehow to let her know I appreciated her love once I got sober, you know, and that I truly was sorry for the type of daughter I had been, and I had to find something that I could come to peace with. And the only thing that I could do through a lot of prayer and a lot of talking to sponsors was that I made the decision that on a daily basis I would be the best daughter I could be. On a daily basis, I would let my mother know that I appreciate her. And every time I had the opportunity to be a good daughter, I would be a good daughter. And I am happy to say I've been able to do that. I have been able to do that. And there are little things that we can do to make up for some of the things that we did. You know, we'll never balance the scales, of course not. But we can do those things. And I, uh, one of the, my things is listening to my mother to, uh, talk. My mother gets on the telephone and she'll talk about things that we've talked about, you know, for years. And, uh, and, uh, it, it, and she, I'll ask her what she's having for dinner. And it's just, you know, it's just a simple question, Mom, what you having for dinner? And she's going to have roast beef. And she has to go through the whole recipe all over again. Now, I've been eating her roast beef for 44 years. I know how she fixes that roast beef. <laughs> Oh, but And I love to listen to her. And she talked, she called the other day from Atlanta, and she was all upset because her little Pekingese had died. And, and I, I'm a dog lover, and I, I knew what she was going through. But it was nice that she called, and she wanted to talk to me about it. And when I was not home, when she called the first time, she told Craig, she said, please make sure she calls me. It's very important. And it was important. And it was real important to me that she knows that it was important that I call her, you know. And I felt like a daughter, and I felt like a good daughter, you know. And I called my mom, and I cried with her because her Pekingese had died, and that was important to her. And by God, if it's important to her, it's important to me. That's my mama, you know. <laughs> Do it every time. I knew it. I knew it. Uh, so I was glad that I could be there for that. You know, that I could be there and that she wanted to talk to me about that. Now, I, uh, I got, uh, uh, mom, mom did a good thing for me about three days later. I attempted suicide after I left the mental hospital and, and, uh, she took me to the hospital and I got my stomach pumped and, or they gave me some stuff that made me sick and I got rid of all the pills I had taken. And, uh, then, uh, three days later, mom threw me out. And she told me to pack my bags and go. I was no longer welcome in her home, ever. Don't come back here. And I can remember the look on her face until the, to this very second I can remember the look on her face. And you have seen the look on that face of the people that loved you. I am totally disgusted with you. I love you and you are part of my heart. But get out of my life. And you know what that's like. And I remember feeling the anger towards this woman and I remember the, the cruel words that I said. And I remember leaving and the way I felt. And I went to stay with the last person in the world who'd have me, and that was my cousin Joanne. And the long and the short of that is inside three weeks, she said, you got to pack your bags and go, woman. I've never seen anybody drink like you. And out, out I was. And I was getting ready to go, and I had thrown some things at her and cussed at her, and, and I'd caused a real scene in the apartment. I don't know why it hit me that particular day. You know, I don't know why it does. But I remember she told me I had to leave, and I said, yeah, I'll leave you. I'll leave. I don't need you, and I don't need anybody else. I'm out of here. And I walked to that door, and I looked out, and it was December the 18th, and it was cold in Atlanta. And it came to me, you got no place to go, kiddo. You got no place to go. There is no one that will take you in. No one. And I asked Joe if she'd call it Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew very little about you. Very, very little. But I went to my first meeting that night, and that was December the 18th, I took my, my last drink, as memory serves me, around noon. And Joanne gave it to me because I was in bad shape. And uh, and she figured before I started, I'd already gone through convulsions and DTs. And, I mean, that I'd, I'd been through a couple of times, and it, so that was just part of the deal, too, you know. But Joe didn't quite know what to do with it, so she was she was a little more protective. And, uh, and she fed me some liquor to keep me breathing. I started getting ready for that meeting around four o'clock. It started at eight, but I was I was not a well person, and and, and bathing was a major undertaking. Uh, and Joe had to help me in the tub and out, and uh, had to help me get dressed uh, because I'd been about twelve hours without a drink now, and I was not doing well. And uh, 
And I went to the, I gotta tell you about the 12 step call because it's, it just, it just tickles me. I just, I just love this 12 step call. They came in at 7.15 just like they were supposed to, and the first one to come through the door was one of the best-looking men I've ever seen in my life to this day. He was, a, he was just glorious, uh, you know, and, and he came in, and he was wearing a blue, why I remember this, he's wearing a blue sweater, you know, glorious, and, and he had a tan like he'd just come back from, from Florida or something. You know, and kind of a silver white hair, just a stunning man. And uh, I, I had long black hair, and it hung over the face, you know, half of it over one eye, because because I wanted to give everybody my sex appeal. And uh, <laughs> and then I always had a cigarette hanging out of my mouth, always. I never, I would carry on a conversation with you, and it'd be in there, and it just bob up and down. I just keep right on talking. It just didn't, you know, it was just because you see, it was part of the image. You had to be tough, and that was part of the image. And that cigarette hanging out of the corner of your mouth, and I left it in there for the first two years I was sober, and you know, it, it just was part of the image, you know, and it worked. It worked. But anyway, he comes in, and I take a look at him, and I think, you know, this might not be too bad. This, this could work. You know, but right behind him came Rebecca Sunnybrook Farm. <laughs> she came in and she had a cute little lace collar on, you know, white collar, a brown princess coat with a little brown velvet collar, itty bitty little heels. You know, I hadn't worn anything under three and a half inches for years. She had these little bitty heels on and white gloves, tiny pearl earrings. And I looked at her and she reached over with a smile that went from ear to ear and said, hi, my name's Bunny. Oh, God. And I looked at Joe as if to say, I'm not going anywhere with anybody named Bunny. We forget this. <laughs> but she gave you a look that only pre alanons can give, which is you go or you're dead. <clears throat> and I went to my first AA meeting. At the end of the meeting, they had gone around. It was a discussion meeting. And at the end of the meeting, they asked me a very important question. They said, Judy, is there anything that you'd like to know about us? Do you have any questions? about us. And I said, no, no, I just don't want to drink anymore. I am sick to death of being drunk. And with everything I had in me then, and with everything I have in me today, I am sick to death of being drunk. I was sick of waking up in places that were filthy just filthy. I was sick of not being able to take care of myself. I was sick of being irresponsible. I was sick of the life I was living. I was sick of being an animal. I was sick of the whole thing. I was worn out. I was 23 years old and I'd fought an 80 year war out there, man, and I can't take anymore. I cannot take anymore. I can't do it anymore. You know, I was just tired. I was just tired. And I uh, picked up my white chip, and I went home, and I took the half pint out from under the pillow, and I put my white chip under there. And they told me I had to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. And this is another thing that tickles me with newcomers. You tell them they got to go to 90 meetings in 90 days, and they look at you like they got some kind of social calendar, you know? I just... <laughs> if you're drunk like I was, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> It's not like you've got dinner plans or something. Yeah, <laughs> they find all kinds of reasons. Well, I don't know if I can work that in. I'm not working, but I don't know if I can work it in. <laughs> but I was the same, you know. But they tell me I had to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. And I believed them. And this is another thing to me that's a miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. Why, out of all these years, I had not believed anyone, I had no faith in anyone or anything, did I believe a bunch of drunks? It has to be divinely inspired. It absolutely has to be, you see. It has to be. Because I never believed anyone. And somehow, you were different. You were different. And that, I believe, comes from our Master. That comes from the Master. I certainly didn't come up with it on my own. You know, and somehow your laughter came across to me as genuine, and it came across to me as real, even in that very first meeting. Uh, I didn't have a car at the time, so I had to start getting on the phone, and they gave me phone numbers, and they said, you call, we'll get you there. 
And I'd start calling at 5 o'clock to get to those meetings in the first couple of weeks. And usually by about 7, I'd find somebody I know that was willing to come and get me and take me to a meeting. I was still, my mouth was horrid. It was, it was just, my mouth was awful. And, and it was street talk. And it's the way that people I ran with talked. And I didn't realize that it offended some people. I also, because I had just put down the bottle, did not mean that I still wasn't going after the men. So when I went to an AA meeting, I was behaving very much like I did in a bar. And if he was good looking, I'd saunter up there and see if we could strike up a conversation and maybe something else later on. You know, and, but the guys in AA wouldn't do that. You know, they wouldn't do that. But at any rate, it it was getting to the point where it was obvious that I did not belong in this group because this group was on the better side of town. And these were all ladies who had gone to the PTA drunk. And and, and at at that time, it made sense to me. I didn't know any other way to go to a PTA meeting. I, I, You know, I thought if you're going to go to one of those things, you better be about half lit. I can't think of any other way to go. But I had no children. I couldn't relate to these women. And nor could they to me. You know, but they were kind, and I want to make that clear. They were kind. They were never cruel to me. They never said anything. One of them came up, and I do believe she said it out of real concern. She said, there's a group on the other side of town we think you'd enjoy. And she sent me to the Atlanta Biscayne room. And that's where I was to start my early sobriety. And it wasn't long that I was into sobriety, probably about two months. And I decided that what I needed to do was get married. Because now I've quit drinking, and I'm not going to run around anymore. It has to do with something these people call principles or something. I don't know. but I knew it would be frowned upon, so I might as well get married. And I'll tell you, if you've got that frame of mind and you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, it doesn't take long to find a husband. Because there's a lot of guys that are new, and they decide they need to get married again, too. So I saw a guy, and I thought, well, he'll do. <laughs> he was breathing, he wore pants. I figured, all right. <laughs> and we got married. And I had four months sobriety. And he had five months sobriety. <laughs> and it was long and short of that, marriage lasted two and a half years. Uh, I didn't drink. Uh, I'm afraid he did. Uh, he really, I don't think he ever quit. Uh, but I must tell you, he was, a, I can't speak badly of him, really. Uh, Ronnie was a good boy. He was a lot of fun, and, uh, and he, but that was just it. He was a boy. Uh, he was 42 years old, and he was a boy. And uh, after I started getting sober, I thought, you know, I've I got to start doing something else here. We moved up to a small community in North Georgia. Now, I have been asphalt and concrete all my life up until this point, and we moved up to this small town in Hiawassee, High- Georgia. And, uh, and it is country. And I was about a year sober, I guess, and my mouth hadn't cleaned up real well. And I was still wearing the same garb that I wore on Peachtree and Tent. <laughs> Walking down the main street of Hiawassee, Georgia. <laughs> God. That cigarette still dangling out of the corner of the mouth, man. <laughs> I saw a guy at a conference about six years ago and told that story. And he said, Judy, I got a, I got a cousin who lives in Hiawassee, Georgia, and they're still talking about that woman from Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> but the glorious thing about the move up there, and it was difficult. It was difficult for a lot of reasons. I was not one of those who snapped right into into sobriety. You see, I fought Alcoholics Anonymous. I wanted to be with you, but I fought with the things that you wanted me to do. I just didn't want to do them. You know, and there was a lot of strife and a lot of guilt and a lot of fighting and just a lot of misery on the inside. You know, and we moved up there and the meetings were few and far between. We only had two meetings a week and they were 30 and 60 miles away and we were broke. And when you looked at going to a meeting, that meant you were going to skip one meal during the week because there wasn't the money to have them both. And those are tough decisions to make. And so there were some weeks I didn't go to a meeting. And what I did is what people in the program told me to do. I got into the literature of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I got into the Cane to Believe. Okay. I love that book. And I began to read that. I never did do real well with, with the big book until I was about five years sober. I don't know. I just couldn't get it. But I got into the 12 and 12. 
And I read that, and I read a lot of As Bill Sees It. And I hung on to those, and those books were my meetings, because that's all I had, and God, I didn't want to drink. I didn't want to drink. And there was that time when Ronnie and I got into a, into a horrible fight, and, and I just didn't know where I was going to go, and I didn't know what was going to happen to me. And for the first time in my life, it was raw pain against raw nerve. There was nothing there to buffer it now, kiddo. This was pain, you know. And I remember going to a little lake that was real close to the house. It's about an eight-acre lake up there. And behind that lake, there's a beautiful mountain. It's just glorious. And I was hurting unlike I'd ever hurt before. And I remember looking up at the top of that mountain, and I remember saying, God, I don't know if you're up there. And I don't know if you can hear me, but I got to have some relief or I'll drink again. And I don't want to drink again. I just don't want to drink again. And the feeling that came over me was so profound because it was just as though there was a good friend sitting next to me who patted my shoulder and said, you're going to be okay, kid. You're going to be okay. And I... And when I got up from that little hillside, for the first time, I was 20, 24, 25 now, and for the first time in my life, I knew I was a child of God. The very first time. That it mattered not to him what I had done. It didn't matter. Somehow, in my innermost self, I realized he wanted happiness for me. That is all he wanted for me. You know? And I was a child of God. And although it was one of the toughest days in my sobriety, it was one of the happiest. Because I knew somewhere, something out there loved me. Something. I had two male sponsors when I came into the program. I did not ask them to be my sponsors. I wouldn't do that. But these two guys were men who believed in the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. One was Big Jim and one was Dad. Big Jim had 12 years and Dad had 8 in the program. And for whatever reason it was, they took me under their wing. And they began to teach me about Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, they did this prior to my going to Hiawassee. You know? But they were loving and they were caring and they were giving men. And the thing that they did that I remember that was so important, as far as members of Alcoholics Anonymous, they didn't walk by me with a flippant, well, read your big book. They walked it. They took me to meetings and they took me to their homes where I could see how they were living, Alcoholics Anonymous. I remember one day I was crazy. I was absolutely crazy and I was shaken. And, and I had been sober a while. I mean, long past the time when I should be shaking and sick and dizzy. And I said, I'm losing it. That's it, man. It's going to fly. I'm out of here. I'm checking out. I can tell. I know that's what's going to happen. I can't handle this sobriety thing. You all can handle it, but I'm too far gone. I can't handle it. No. And Jim took me in his car to his home, and he and his wife sat with me all afternoon, and they gave me iced tea, and we talked, and we talked. And somewhere along that day and that afternoon, things on the inside started to settle. You know, and I thought maybe I can make it one more day. Maybe one more day. You see, Big Jim and Dad knew Alcoholics Anonymous. They knew the big book as well as anybody I've ever known. But they also knew it was more important for me to see that you can live through this. And they took the time. They didn't give me something that was cute and flippant. You know, they took the time. Uh, I came into the room now, and I'm building about two and a half and three years. And I came into the room, and I was miserable. And even at two and a half and three years sobriety, I was miserable. It was nothing uncommon for me to stand up and cuss somebody out in a meeting. It was just nothing uncommon. You know, I had something to say, and they were going to hear it whether they wanted to or not. You know, and the mouth still wasn't much better. You know, but I began to learn some things. And Dad taught me things, you know, like you can't hit people and stay sober. <laughs> And Dad had a way of teaching things. You know, we had sponsors back then didn't suggest anything to you. <laughs> they threatened you a lot. <laughs> and Jim had a way of saying things that, you know, he just cut to the core of man of very few words, but they were important. He never wasted a one. Never wasted a one. And I remember telling Jim when I was so broke, I said, you know, I'd go out and work those streets and we'd be out of this mess. I said, I'd put some groceries in that pantry. We would, I wouldn't have to go without food and I could go to any meetings I wanted to go to. And he said, yeah, baby, you could. And he said, and I'd still love you. 
He said, but what you got to ask yourself is, and it's real important here, and I want you to ask yourself this every time from now on when you make a major decision in life. What's it going to do to your sobriety? And if you can go back out there and work those streets and stay sober, honey, and have at it. Well, he blew it. There was no way I could do that. And I knew that. And I knew that. I went through a period, too, right around two and a half and three years. My God, I was going to get good. Oh, I was, I was so scared. And I went to Jim. And I said, Jim, you know, I start working these steps and everything, and I start taking this inventory, and I start talking to God, and I'm going to end up one of those tight-lit, blue-haired old ladies that just walks around going... (laughs) 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 And Jim just looked at me, and he took a long drag off his cigarette and said, Don't worry about it, baby. It's never going to (laughs) happen. It hadn't happened yet, you know. Because I was so afraid. You know, the people that I had seen as good in my life were all so condemning. They were all so condemning, and my God, I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to be that. And if that's what it meant, I didn't want to be that, and I didn't know what else to do. And so I went to the people who knew. You know, I went to the people who knew. And I think each and every one of us have our purpose in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know that part of the Big Jim's purpose and Dad's purpose in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, was to be there when I got there. Let me share something else, and this is exact, this is only for the gentleman, okay? When the, a woman comes in, and she's a young woman, and she comes from where I come from, and you're looking at her, and you know it took her three weeks to get those blue jeans on she's wearing. You just remember there's 12 steps to this program, baby, not 13. Don't you forget it. I will love those men forever. Both of them have passed on now, and I miss them much. But I can tell you that every time I am, I am graced to do this, that they're right here, both of them. And I love them, and I'll always love them. You know, and, uh, and they were so important to me and so important into my life. I got into doing things in the program. I got into going, I, I always loved meetings anyway, but I got into doing things like being in a group rep. And that was fun. And I got into doing things like being on the answering service for Atlanta for Saturday nights. And that was a lot of fun. And I got involved in doing a lot of things with different roundups and different committees. And a lot of things involved with the Biscayne. And that was fun. And my, my husband, Craig, and I, have got, we got married in 76. I divorced Ronnie in 74, and Craig and I got married in 76. And it's been a good marriage. And it's been tough. There have been tough times in sobriety. And don't let, everybody let, don't let anybody let you think that there's not tough times. Okay. The past three years have been real tough. My, uh, my husband, Craig, has been back out to drink uh, several times. He had 10 years sobriety, and he lost it. He had six years sobriety, and he lost it. And I'm not going to tell you that I handled that graciously. I didn't. You know, uh, I'm not even close to being a good Al-Anon. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm one of those, uh, you better get home so I can kill you. And that's kind of, you know... Uh, and when he did come home from this last one, and he was a sick puppy, and after about a day of him being ill, uh, I came home from work, and I had already uh, called the attorney, and I just couldn't make a decision as to what I was going to do, and so I just let it go, because I knew God would let me know what to do when I needed to do it, and, and uh, Craig came to me, and he said, well, what are you going to do, honey? Uh, he said, are we splitting up or what? And I said, you know, I don't know today. Uh, maybe tomorrow I'll know. Let's just take this thing one day at a time. And um, Mike Craig has almost four years now, and uh, we're still doing it one day at a time. And recently, we decided we were going to uh, to make a move in our lives, and it came about rather frequently through through a series of events that are too long to go into now. And uh, we uh, decided we'd move to Sherrodsville, Ohio. Now, I've been asphalt and concrete all my life. Sherrodsville, Ohio, is not as large population-wise as a subdivision I lived in in Atlanta. <laughs> We, um, my husband had to come up here for various and assorted reasons, and he came back and he said, God, Judy, it's just beautiful up there. And I said, it's just everything's so clean and everything's so nice. And, uh, we had, uh, had some bad problems, uh, due to the recession, uh, and job losses, et cetera, and things were not going well. 
And uh, I said, well, let's let's put the house on the market and see what happens, you know. And I'm thinking it'll be six months to a year because that's what it's taken and sometimes even longer in Atlanta at that time. And uh, we sold the house in two weeks. And uh, it was a, a very unsober thing. We, we went ahead. We sold the house. We moved to Ohio. Neither one of us had a job. Uh, no place to live. We stayed with uh, with my brother-in-law and his wife, and that was really wonderful. We had a wonderful month and a half with them, and I was a little anxious. I didn't know how that was going to work out, but uh, it was nice, you know. It was nice to be with them, and, and it was peaceful, and I enjoyed it. And we ended up getting an old farmhouse at auction, and I'm talking an old farmhouse. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, I called the guy that used to live there, and his name's Ray, and I said, Ray, do you have any idea how old the house is? And he's, he's a good old country boy, and he said, well, Judy, he said, my family moved in there 52 years ago, and hell, that thing was old then, so I'm not really good. <laughs> but, you know, we were living in a small farming, very, very small farming community, and, and, you know, it's just another thing that Alcoholics Anonymous has allowed me to do. And what Alcoholics Anonymous has allowed me to do in my life is absolutely fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating, you see, because I've been able to experience so much and meet so many and talk to so many. You know? And there was a time in my sobriety, and I, and I worked for temporary service for a long time. Works out real good if you got a bad temper. And um, <laughs> I, you laugh. It kept bread on the table for two years, man. It worked out great. And... Uh, so I, I got to work in a lot of different industries and business, and that was and that was good. And then I got on with the firm, and and I was with them for a long period of time, and uh, I established a good rapport with them, and I established a good record with them, and uh, worked my way up. And I was in sales for about seven years, and did very well in that field, and I loved it. It was in information processing, and that was fun. And uh, then they asked me to come back to them after I had left, and they asked me if I'd come back and be their. Uh, Southeastern Regional Manager, and I was their Southeastern Regional Manager for uh, about a year and a half, and that was a lot of fun, and it was something different, you know, something that I never would have had without Alcoholics Anonymous, never would have had that. And then when we moved to Ohio, uh, actually when I when I left the job and uh, the situation hit in Atlanta and jobs were not available, I had been doing some floral design work. That's one of my hobbies. I like working with flowers. And uh, so that since nothing else was available, I went and applied at a floral shop, and I was a floral designer for about two years. And, and that was interesting, and I got to meet some beautiful people there. And I made some friends there, and one of which was a good Christian woman. Okay, Now, I had never really known a good Christian on a one-to-one. You know? uh, and, and, and she and I got to talk a lot about different philosophies, and she knew I was in the program. And as a matter of fact, the pin I have on tonight was a going-away gift that she gave to me because we established a friendship, and I loved that woman very much. It was nice to be there. And then I get up here to Ohio, and I get to that there were no jobs, and I started working for Manpower as a temporary in a factory. And that's a trip, man. I've never worked in a factory before. You know, this is just, an, I mean, this is new. News, you know, and I was just fascinated by the whole thing. It just blew my mind, you know. And all of this is because of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got to tell you, you know, in the back of our old farmhouse, there's a beautiful meadow, and there's two old apple trees out there that still bear fruit. And uh, I got up, oh, uh, I guess it was Thursday morning, and I looked out that back window, and uh, there was a doe and her two fawns out there feeding, and I just died. I just, I, I just sat there and I thought, my God, you know, uh, I got up one morning and, uh, there was a doe and a buck and four little baby raccoons out there just eating away, just having themselves, it's like something out of a Disney flick, you know, it's incredible. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't believe it. You know, I just couldn't believe it. And we got to, Craig and I got to be, which I just blows my mind, but we got to work, um, uh, for the Delroy County Volunteer Fire Department. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> We, they had their, their annual carnival that they have every year, and it was our side of the roads turned to work. <laughs> That's how they divide it up. <laughs> so the neighbor came over, and he said, it's our side of the road, so we got to go down to Delroy tonight. Now, Delroy consists of a Dairy Queen, a bank, and a gas station. But they set up a carnival down there, boy, and things are popping in Delroy for three nights, you know. <laughs> And uh, and I got to go down there. They allowed me to work in the uh, cutting the pie section. And um, and you see, what was nice about that is I'm part of a community now, you know. And I want to be part of a community now. See, that's what you all have given me. 
is that I want to be a part of. I'm not afraid to step out anymore and live. You see, I want it. I want it. I want to have all these experiences, working with different people, working in different places, getting to know different people. I want it because I cut myself short, man. I cut myself out for so long. And now I got no excuses. And since I got no excuses, I want it all, baby. I want it all, you know? Yes. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's glorious. It's glorious. We got about four acres out there. And Craig says, well, what are you going to do with four acres? I said, I want to raise buffalo. (laughs) You can raise buffalo on four acres. Two head, but you can raise buffalo. (laughs) Now, I don't know what we're going to do, you know, but it matters not. I want to share with you two or three more joys, and then I'll sit down. Working with others in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. Glorious gift. Glorious gift. One of the best. I am a little bit disturbed because periodically, and more so here lately than what I used to see, I am seeing where long-term members are deciding they need something more than Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't understand that. You know, and I suppose that I should say it's okay, but I don't believe it. I don't believe it's okay. Okay, my feeling is it's the height of selfishness and self-centeredness to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, get your life back in order, get the things that you want, and then say, bye-bye, folks. (laughs) And that is why I have such awe and such respect for those who keep coming. For those who keep showing up at meetings, for those who tell people like me with 20 years that, yes, you can have 25, yes, you can have 35, yes, you can have 42. That's important to me, man. That is my lifeblood. I need to know that. No. And I do respect that. And I am grateful. I am grateful for those that keep coming back for us that keep coming back for us, you know. But I got got to tell you, there was one little girl I worked with in Atlanta, and without a doubt, one of the sickest I'd ever worked with. And God, she was mean. Oh, she, I don't know how I got her, but she was mean, you know. (laughs) And, And she would come into the room, and she spoke to no one. She spoke to absolutely no one. And, of course, my being as defiant as I am, she was going to talk to me, you know. And if I had to bump into her, I'd bump into her and finally she got to where she'd say a few words and all and pretty soon she got to where she talked to Craig a little bit now that for for about six months truthfully we were the only two that she'd talked to and there were some other folks that were a little frightened of her and so they wouldn't approach her much okay and for about two years that child didn't do much more than go to meetings she never even announced who she was or what she was okay <laughs> And that kept going, and then pretty soon she started opening up a little bit. And let me tell you what I got to experience, and it's just been two years ago. Two years ago, I saw that little girl in front of 1,500 people at a conference behind a microphone singing her heart out. And I sat there in the audience, and I bawled like a baby. Because I had seen that kid. I had seen her when she was so afraid. She was so frightened to do anything, to go anywhere. And there right before me was a miracle, and I got to see every second of it. Every second. Now, I got to see it. God blessed me to see that. Now, and then we must talk about, about the family. Now, my mother and I have become very, very close. And, and I'm grateful for that. And Mama knows my story. Now, I didn't cover it up to her either. Now, and uh, my sister, my one sister knows, the other one uh, doesn't know uh, because she's the prude. And um, <laughs> that's a fact. I, even my mama says so. Uh, so <laughs> Sometimes I look at her and think, God, why don't you drink? You know, it just... <laughs> But uh, Mother and I, I, when I was in Atlanta, I'd take Mom shopping about once every six weeks, and she likes to go to Shoney's for breakfast, and then we'd, we'd hit one of the malls. And so we were out this one particular day, and we were out shopping, and we had had breakfast, and we were en route to one of the malls, and, and the car was quiet. Uh, and Mom reaches over, and uh, for no reason, uh, she pats me on the shoulder, and... Uh, 
She said, you're a good person, Judy, and you're a good daughter, and Mama loves you very much. And that's what Alcoholics Anonymous does, see. It was worth all the times I came into a meeting and sat on my hands because I was afraid I was just going to smack the next person I saw. It was worth all the times that I sat there and I couldn't say a word. I couldn't say a word because I knew that if I opened up, you all would say, she's nuts, get her out of here. She's going to hurt one of us. It was worth all that. It was worth the time between two and a half and three years sobriety when I wanted to kill myself. And if you're sitting out there thinking about suicide and you're right at that time span, you're okay, baby. And don't let anybody tell you different. Okay? You're okay. You see, because the joy of that, and think about how important this is, please. The joy of that is you're not thinking about drinking. And for the alcoholic, that's what's important. (laughs) You know, but it's not healthy thinking, so do get with your sponsor. You know, don't (laughs) don't nourish it too long. Don't nourish it too long. No. I walk in tonight. I'm down in the lobby. And I don't know where a young lady that, uh, that I knew in Atlanta, Suzanne, came up. And I hadn't seen her in years. You know. And these are things that make you full, and these are things that make your life rich. And these are things that when you wake up in the morning, you look forward to the day, you know. And that, you know, the lovely thing about it is that for so long I didn't believe in God. You know, if there was a God, he wanted nothing to do with me, and that was fine, Jack, because I wanted nothing to do with him either. That was okay. You know, and I almost hate to admit this, I really do, but I've been going to church lately. Now, I'm, I, I, believe me, I am not a devout churchgoer yet by any means, and I don't have... It's kind of like when you're going swimming, you know, you kind of put your toe in the water just to see what it's like. That's about where I am right now, you know, but it blew my mind, and it's a small little tiny church, and I just hadn't been to church in years, and, and that's something I'm trying, and that's something that's new, and that's because of Alcoholics Anonymous. I brought to you a bitter, cold, hateful woman who wanted no one's love, and who wanted to love no one. And that's what I had made up my mind. That's what I was going to be. I brought to you a woman who had decided she was going to die drunk. Somewhere along the line, I decided I would die drunk. And somewhere along the line, I decided that would be okay with me. And that's what I brought to you. That's what I brought to you. If I have said anything good tonight, it is because I've learned it from you. I didn't say it on my own. I knew nothing about living. I knew nothing about loving when I got here. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. You did this. You did it. So if you don't like what you see, it's all your fault. (laughs) There's a paragraph that I close with in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I love it. It's my favorite. And if you don't know where it is, you read the book till you find it. (laughs) And the book says, Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit. And you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.